almost. And I do have a presentation. So oh, okay, so let me, let me screen share. There we, I, I, I just enabled it. Perfect, thanks for letting me know. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today completes a wonderful week, day seven of Lifestyle Medicine Week. And to introduce today's special guest, we have Dr. Maduri Paideseni. Hi, thank you, Chef AJ. It's just been an amazing week. Thank you for having us. Um, so I'm Dr. Madhuri Paidiseti. I live in Chicago. Um, I love lifestyle medicine, whole food, plant-based nutrition, and I love to dance. I am extremely honored to introduce our chief guest, Dr. Prachi Garodia. Dr. Garodia is a triple board certified physician in internal and integrative medicine and a diplomat in lifestyle medicine. She's highly dedicated to healing patients holistically and has trained in functional medicine. Dr. Garodia offers non-pharmacological modalities to help patients with pain alleviation and to improve the skin and aging process. She is trained in medical, cosmetic and battlefield acupuncture, as well as electro acupuncture. Dr. Garodia embraces traditions of meditation, especially loving kindness meditation and mindfulness techniques to guide her patients. She's a diplomat in Ayurveda, a certified yoga instructor and therapist, an empathic healer, plant-based Ayurvedic chef, master gardener, and an animal, environmental, and whole foods plant-based advocate. Dr. Garodia serves as the co-chair of the Happiness Science and Positive Health Member Group of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. She also serves as the national education champion for whole health for the, for the Veterans Health Administration, facilitating courses for colleagues and staff nationally, and is the medical lead and clinical champion for the implementation of whole health at her VA facility. Dr. Garodia is a medical director um, for the whole health at the VA Echo Vision 20, which services several states in the Pacific Northwest. She is very grateful for, service, for serving the veterans. Dr. Garodia has published several review articles in medical journals, has co-authored a reference book chapter on Ayurveda in 2020, and is working on several upcoming book chapters and articles. She has earned several awards, including being recognized as one of America's most compassionate doctors several times, Patient's Choice Award, On Time Doctor Award, and American Medical Association Physicians Recognition Award with Commendation. With a lifelong focus on holistic health for the last 20 plus years, Dr. Prachi Garodia has been educating, empowering, and guiding her patients on a journey of healing, on a mission to help her patients reclaim their vibrant health. Dr. Garodia has presented workshops and lectures nationwide and internationally at conferences on diet and lifestyle optimization, integrative management of various diseases, and incorporating Ayurvedic principles and philosophy into their healing and treatment plans. She emphasizes stress management maintaining healthy sleep habits and eating a balanced whole food plant-based diet and the beneficial role it plays in human health by boosting immunity and helping with chronic reversible and preventable diseases. Dr. Garodia is a master gardener, an ardent seed saver and an animal lover. She grows her own organic veggies herbs, fruits, and berries. She maintains a 
beautiful native plant garden, a monarch butterfly way station, and has National Wildlife Federation certified habitat on her property. These are areas Dr. Garodia maintains on, on her property for the wildlife to thrive. She has an amazing rural acreage property with the creek flowing through it. Multiple native plants and oak trees are host to many varieties of birds, frogs, snakes, and insects. They had a red-tailed hawk nest and a red Oregon fox cave on their property. Also, they are seasonally frequented by families of deer, turkeys, native Oregon quails, bears, and cougars. Dr. Garodia has designed and crafted several butterfly-friendly and native, uh, native gardens on her property. She loves practicing yoga and meditation, traveling, spending time in nature, and hiking with her friends and her husband. She's a trained Indian classical dancer and enjoys rock and canvas painting. She's a foodie and finds joy in creating delicious and easy to make plant-based Ayurvedic recipes for her friends and family. For Dr. Garodia, food is medicine. For more information, please check out her newly launched, newly being launched website at, at www.drprachigarodia.com or you can connect with her on social media via Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, or Twitter handles. So I am extremely excited to hear her insight on lessons learned for ancient traditions, utilizing nature's intelligence to optimize your health. Now I would I'm sorry. Now I would like to warmly welcome our dear friend, Dr. Prachi Garodia to speak. Thank you so much, Madhuri, for the warm welcome. And um, yeah, and thank you, Chef AJ, for having me here. I'm so grateful, you know, to offer this platform to the whole lifestyle medicine movement so people can get more aware and familiar with it. I'm really excited about offering what I've learned through these years. I, I, you have you 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 wear so many hats. I mean, you're an Ayurvedic vegan chef, among many other things. Totally, totally. And that's one of my passions, actually. I love creating like simple recipes, which are not too crazy or complicated and balancing them and creating them for the unique need of the individual. Because, you know, Ayurveda is all about personalized medicine and it's very proactive, preventive. And you know a lot about like the herbs and spices we cook with. So it's really, really um, wonderful to create flavorful nutritious meals. How does Ayurvedic medicine and lifestyle medicine intersect with each other? That's an amazing question. And I have actually a presentation today, like the slides, in which I'll show because all of these systems, the holistic systems of medicine overlap significantly. So lifestyle medicine talks about the basic six pillar of you know, health, including nutrition, sleep, personal connections, stress management, staying active and staying away from the drugs and substance use. And similarly, um, Ayurveda, Ayurveda is considered a whole system of medicine. And all of the things which we see in modern day times, for example, uh, yoga, meditation, mindfulness, massage therapy, aromatherapy, chanting and music therapy, all of those actually have root in ancient traditional wisdom. You know, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, all of those have been practiced for thousands of years. And, and it's been time tested and tried. So it's amazing how these overlap. Right. And you do acupuncture too, right? Yes, I've trained in that. And I have an interesting story. Um, you know, I, I grew up in India and, uh, you know, I grew up with, Use, utilizing Ayurveda, homeopathy, naturopathy, all of those, you know, the alternative practices, which were traditional back in India, and grew up in a very healthy um, household with three fresh cooked meals, fresh farmer's market, uh, you know, vegetables delivered to our home. 
So all of that. When I came to the U.S., that's when, you know, the, it was a whole big shift, you know, of health and living and well-being. Um, anyway, long story short, I did my residency in New York and, you know, met my husband, started practicing. And that's when I realized that what we are offering here to population and people is really not the true healing. It's, it wasn't looking at root causes of disease. And I'm talking, you know, 15, 20 years back when I started my journey. So that, in, you know, my husband inspired me to actually go back to India and train extensively in Ayurveda, meditation, yoga therapy, and all acupuncture, everything at that time. That's fantastic. I love that you combine you know, kind of East-West medicine in a way. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's a total beautiful blend. It's always evidence-based. So I try to offer very safe practices to our population. And that's why when I came back, I trained further in functional medicine and integrated medicine board certification. And finally, the lifestyle medicine board certification to make sure as, that I learn and gather as much evidence and tools in my toolbox, which I can offer to my patients then. And where are you located if somebody, could they see you in person if they wanted to? Yes, I mean, um, right now we are in transition. So in three days, we will be relocating to Olympia, Washington. Right now we are in Ashland, Oregon, Southern Oregon, which is such a beautiful city. But Olympia is amazing too. So we are really excited and looking forward to it. We love the Pacific Northwest. Great, yeah, it's a beautiful part of the United States. Totally. Yeah, well, if you want to share your slides, I've enabled screen share. So anytime you're ready. Perfect. Let me go ahead and start that screen sharing in a moment. All right. Wonderful. And let's see, let me move this to the side and then start the slide show from beginning. And please perfect. let me know. Okay. That's perfect now, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to move the, the controls to the side because otherwise it takes up the whole screen and I can't see anything any, any, anywhere after that. So just give me one more second and we'll move ahead with it then. No problem. All right, wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. Um, just wanted to, you know, introduce to everyone how to learn to recognize first, because if we don't know what's going on or we are not educated on the topic, we live unaware of that issue. So most of us in the modern day and life, you know, times are actually living in dissociation with the nature's intelligence cycles of energy. And um, this is my humble effort to introduce some of the tools and tips and ideas about how to sync your life. So all of us can be much more healthier, much more productive, happy and blissful. So going on to the next slide would be, did I jump one? Yeah. So. All right, somehow this is not showing the second slide. Okay, anyway, so research has validated the circadian clock. It was actually uh, three American research scientists. They started their, their work in 1980s, but over time there was more and more evidence which came up. And finally, uh, so Jeffrey Hall, Michael Rosbach, and Michael Young, uh, they all got together and they worked on this and finally won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2017. And what that shows us um, that th there is an internal cycle which is syncing in with the, you know, the nature cycle and it's called the circadian. Circa means a day, um, uh, circa means circle and uh, you know, timing and then um, DN is day. So circadian rhythm is there, which is an internal 24 hour cycle. And they first uh, started experimenting, finding it out in fruit flies. And then they found that there are a couple of other 
cycles of you know, organ intelligence, which are located in tissues. So the circadian rhythm was found to control different functions of physiologic, uh, you know, metabolism, behavior cycles, all of those functioning was controlled by the circadian rhythm. And we'll talk more. Uh, this is a very colorful slide about what, you know, where the central clock is, the master clock in the brain. And I'll tell, you know, we'll talk about that briefly. So the master clock is the suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN, and that's located in the anterior hypothalamus of the brain. This is the most powerful pacemaker and uh, you know, which, which runs the whole show as to say, and it's affected by several things. We'll talk about that. You can see the light coming in and there is food which affects it. So really, um, you know, can get affected with the light and dark cycle of nature. And that's how it behaves and runs. And uh, the peripheral or cellular uh, clocks are found in stomach, heart, liver, pancreas, different muscles, pretty much all the cells. And we have around 300 trillion of cells. So there are those tiny little baby clocks running everywhere because they're all syncing with the intelligence of nature. And we will also learn how we can, we are, you know, mindlessly or not knowingly disrupting those cycles. So there are several other things which I would talk about. This is not just like a simple, okay, you, you, you know, entrain the or match the cycles to work together. This is all work through the genetic system. So they turn on or off some of the genes and they create some proteins, which create some hormonal effects and other uh, biophysiological effects on the body. So these regulate the activity of three to 10% of the cellular clocks and rest of it's run by the main clock. So coming to the another big uh, slide, uh, it shows us physical activity, light, food, all of those are interplaying in this circadian rhythm. And Zeitgebers, Z-E-I-T-G-E-B-E-R-S, these are rhythmically occurring phenomena that have primary control over circadian rhythm. And the two main ones are light and food. So the, nat the natural cycle of day and night actually lets a lot of the changes happen, including hormonal production, sleep, metabolic uh, you know, changes, including breakdown of sugar, release of insulin, release of cortisol. All of those hormonal changes are controlled by those clocks. And any kind of circadian disturbance, that means people who are living night shift disorder or they're flying frequently transmeridian or you know, they're staying up late at night or doing the screen thing, which our colleague, Dr. Mithika Kanabar had covered, you know, too much of blue light at nighttime, all of those habits and practice or, or waking up at nighttime and sneaking in to eat at, you know, in the fridge late at night. So all of those are disruptors, which will lead to imbalance of the cycle and will lead to obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, fibrosis, you know, all of those complications, which we see uh, with chronic diseases. So let's go on to the next one. This is a complicated slide, but it's beautiful because it ties everything together, including the brain, which is a suprachiasmatic nucleus triggered by light and food, and then affecting all of the hormones and metabolic functions and liver clock and other primary clock and clock control genes. So it ties everything together. And in the next slide, I'll briefly talk about some of the hormonal, uh, hormonal productions, uh, which are very uh, important to this cycle, including you know, melatonin and glucocorticoids and insulin. All right, so this is a beautiful slide too. And it does tell us how important it is for us to 
you know, control that light and both the lunar and the solar cycle with the sun and the moon. Um, this can be triggering the pineal gland and also the food, like we already mentioned about the untimely eating of food, also type of food will, will uh, change the amount of tryptophan or melatonin. So melatonin is one of the hormones and L-tryptophan is one of the proteins, which is uh, basically a precursor of melatonin. So melatonin is formed from L-tryptophan and serotonin, which is another mood hormone, which affects our happiness. So all of those are interconnected. And melatonin is one of the oldest molecules on earth. It's considered around 3.5 billion uh, years old. And it's a very powerful biological clock regulator. So in the presence of light, particularly of blue wavelengths, there's a hormone in the brain, which is melanopsin, that is increased and that decreases the release of melatonin. And I don't want you to be like learning this by heart or becoming masters or PhD scientists. So I'll, I'll just short, shortcut it because you know it's a lot of information. And the good thing is there's more and more evidence. Obviously those three uh, research scientists did a major job and won the Nobel prize, but there's continuing work being done on this to see how we can adjust or, you know, reverse or manage some of the uh, imbalances which have happened in the body. All right, so this is a very sweet example of what the clock looks like. So for example, you can look at the clock and starting from the left hand side, which is six o'clock, um, you know, three, uh, the six o'clock on the clock here, not the six o'clock by the clock. Um, you can see that the melatonin secretion starts decreasing. And then at around between seven to eight, the bowel movement is likely. Then the testosterone and other hormones peak um, at that time. A lot of alertness at mid noon, actually your hunger really rises high because of the effect of the hormones. And then after during the day, there's a lot of good focus, concentration, coordination, a lot of physical strength. Your blood pressure starts rising in the evening because of those shifts of the hormones again. Uh, before you sleep, the body temperature is the highest. And then finally, the body temperature starts going down as melatonin starts increasing. And then your bowel movements are suppressed because the body's focusing more on cleaning the cells and detoxification. So if you are focusing too much on eating at nighttime, it's disrupting that cycle. It's uh, promoting too much of insulin production at that time. And the pancreatic cells and clocks are saying, no, no, we don't want this. And the brain doesn't want it at that time because it's trying to sleep and do the healing. But you know, we are being naughty. So we went and ate. So now the pancreas cells are forced to secrete insulin and that's desyncing them. So that it, that's taking it away from the nature's intelligence. So it, it gets shifted. Same thing with light exposure. We are you know, watching the, the, you know, the, the screens or working on the computer and waking up at nighttime at two o'clock and checking our phone. What that is doing, it's messing up the melatonin production, shutting it down causing the, the downward pathway to get disrupted. You know, the insulin goes up and everything else goes, the cortisol goes up and then you start feeling hungry, you know, on, and it's misaligned with when you should be feeling hungry and when those hormones should be going up in your body. So it's very interesting. I would encourage everybody to go back and research more and read up more. So anyway, so talking about the cycle of nature, I just, uh, you know, we talked with Chef AJ briefly before about my Ayurveda training and all that. So it's very interesting that when I went back to India and trained extensively in the Eastern philosophy and whole systems of healing, including Ayurveda, acupuncture, yoga, meditation. So Ayurveda and yoga sister sciences. And both of them have the same focus, you know, to heal the body as a whole completely. And we'll talk more about that. 
So I read the definition is Ayur, which is life or longevity, and Veda is the knowledge or wisdom or science of you know healing and living. Um, so Ayurveda is a way or art or science of living. So it's a profoundly effective healing science that really looks deeper into the elemental nature of every being an object, like the whole universe is formed of those five elements. So it's a universal true phenomena, which is, you know, in us, around us, outside and inside, everywhere. So it's, it's really fascinating to learn about that. And I know in the previous talks, um, a lot of people were tuned in and they were familiar with what Ayurveda and yoga is. So that was really uh, nice to see. Anyway, so Ayurveda has a very unique definition of health, and it says an individual who is in a state of equilibrium of these, these, these things is called to be in optimal health. So, and that's the Sanskrit, uh, you know, wording, uh, the Sanskrit uh, shloka of that. So it talks about the three doshas, which are the bioenergetic principles or the you know, bodies, physiological principles. And you might have heard the name of Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. And in our later slides, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Agni, which is the metabolic fire and the digestive fire. And similar to those clocks, it's present me, but the seat is mainly in the digestive organs, you know, mostly the stomach, but they are located in all the cells. So you can, you can figure out where we're going with that, you know, because if it's located everywhere, just like those clocks are, it has to be serving a purpose there. So anyway, dhatus are the seven layers of tissues which the body is made of, starting from rasa, rakta, you know, all of those, which is plasma, blood, you know, all, yeah, there's seven layers of body tissues, just like in modern medicine. And malakriya is the elimination process, the detoxifying process. And those are three, the urination, bowel elimination, and sweating. Um, so the physical body, which is in a balanced state, performing their functions in proper order as well. So here comes the catch, the expansion beyond the body, which is the soul, the senses, the mind, and all of they have harmony with each other, internal peace, happiness, joy, and that's what you define optimal health. So swastha is a very important term. Swa means the self and sta means sitting or stable or grounded in the self. So swastha, a person who's sitting in self comfortably, peacefully, happinessly, you know, full of happiness and joy and total ease, harmony is what is called optimal health. And that sounds like a tall order to achieve in today's day, day and uh, ages. But does this ring a bell of where modern, you, where you might have heard part of this definition? So maybe you can put in the chat box. I can't see it right now because I'm on the different. Um, Zoom and I'm not able to see the chat, but definitely will enjoy looking at it and see if some of you recognize this saying from you know, some of the modern uh, places. So Ayurveda said thousands of years ago what World Health Organization has defined today. So around you know, a few years back, WHO came up with a pretty close definition, including the body, physical, emotional, social well-being. Yeah. So next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about Ayurveda. And I know we are limited time. I was, you know, should tell Chef AJ that this, this is not, you know, this is unlimited knowledge and wisdom. And I probably have to talk like 10 times over um, different places to really um, express all of, you know, part of this. So anyway, sister uh, science to yoga, we covered that. It's a whole system, timeless wisdom originated in ancient Vedic culture. It's a complete, proactive, preventive, personalized way of looking at health. So that's an approach which has been practiced for thousands of years. And the key 
Um, there are some key principles uh, to connect with our divinity and live in harmony with laws of nature is one of a very important principle. And living in moderation is also highly recommended and not going to any too much extreme because that causes friction of mind if you're going to extremes. So that's very important too. This science is applicable to all living beings and it focuses on the uniqueness of individuals. And we already talked about, you know, the self-correcting mechanism and balance. It, it teaches us how to recognize if we are not balanced and how to bring it back to balance by using the right tools. And we'll talk more about the tools, including sleep, nutrition, other external things and internal things like meditation and other practices which we can do. So again, a um, lot of those things um, we already talked about because I love it so much. I keep on talking about it. Living in harmony with the elements and nature, my, min, microcosm as macrocosm, whatever we see outside is all inside of us and vice versa. And very important principle, which I want to talk briefly today about is the philosophy of non-violence or ahimsa. And not just external non-violence, it starts with the thought process, the words and your deeds, okay? So it's not like you're going around killing everybody and that's only violence. Violence is violence in your thoughts. Your, so, so just be um, you know, learning to recognize when you've started being a little bit aggressive or judgmental uh, you know, with others and being mindful and aware and try to pacify that emotion healthily is very important. Otherwise it creates a lot of imbalances and disturbance in the psyche, which translate down to the body. So anyway, next slide, I'll briefly cover a few slides about Ayurveda so the listeners will have a slightly idea if they haven't, if they don't know about it, at least they'll have a little idea and it's fun. And I encourage everybody to go back later and do, you know, just Google a body type or body quiz. And that's really, really a fun way to start to learn what body type you might be uh, according to the energetic principles. And we'll talk more about that. So for example, we talked about the three doshas, which, which are the biophysiological uh, properties and you know functioning of the body. And vata controls the energy of movement lot of it's the elements related to water forming water dosha and causing the imbalance or balance are the space or ether and air so the qualities of water are dry light cold rough subtle mobile clear and astringent these are the properties or qualities of vata and you can imagine in the next few slides i have fun uh, depiction or picturization of what of what, of what the animal will look like or what the object might look like or what the person might look like and similarly for the rest of the doshas too so air and ether or space is light air moves a lot causing roughness uh, you know it's it's subtle, even space is very subtle. Air is typically considered dry. We are not talking about water principle in there. So it's dry air and cold. And uh, pitta, for example, the next uh, dosha is formed of mostly fire. And that's why it's shown in red circle there. So fire with a little bit of water thrown in just for the fun part of it. <laughs> so, because it moves, pitta is mobile. So that's why the water comes in to move it uh, with the fire. So the qualities are hot, sharp, light, oily, liquid, spreading, sour, smelly, red, and yellow, you know, all of those. And somehow um, by mistake, I don't know how the bitter and pungent, well, the bitter should not be there. So I don't know what, what happened. I was translating the slides and correcting the, the, the you know, the, the format and everything got messed up. So I had to move a lot of things. Anyway, so kapha, the third type of bio, you know, psychological or uh, physiological principle or, or quality is 
earth and water primarily. It's heavy, slow, wet, cool. You know, think of it like, you know, earth, like mud and earth. And so that's how it behaves. Oily, smooth, dense, soft, cloudy, sweet, and salty. So those are the characteristics. All right. So water causes all kind of movement in the body and it's responsible for catabolism of, you know, breakdown and thinning and aging and all of that. So it's related to that. Pitta, on the other hand, is the energy of digestion and transformation or metabolism. Kapha is the one which causes anabolism or causes structure, strong structure, lubrication, substance to the body. So all of these are present in some degree in everybody. So all the five elements are present in everybody, but every person has its own unique concentration of those elements in themselves. That's why there's nobody else who's exactly like you, who, who has the exact looks or eating habits or sleeping habits or mood habits or you know, mental aptitude or whatever. Everybody is very, very unique. Was it, because it could be just like a 2% difference in Pitta and that can shift a lot of things. It could be imbalanced Pitta and that could shift a lot of things. So we'll, all of the Ayurvedic knowledge and wisdom is based on the knowledge of knowing the elements and what they do and how they express in your body and mind and how you can pacify or bring them back to balance by using the right tools as we talked about. So the next slide is really fun slide. And there are different, different breakdowns of different type of pitta, vata, kapha. There are five types of each, prana, udana, vyana, samana, apana, vayu, which is the type of wind in the body. And similarly, pitta is pachak, ranjak, sadak, alochak, brajak, and similarly, kapha too. So anyway, qualities of Vata, Pitta, Kapha, I love this one, you know, because it connects people to the Vata is like windy day and wind is blowing and it's cold and dry and it dries you out and all of that. And Pitta is like a hot fire. So it's red and yellow and actual heating and it's moving and all of that and smelling. So all of that is there. And Kapha is like a big, you know, cart full of mud. Basically, it's heavy, dense, you know, static. It won't move on its own. It's cold to touch. It's slow. All of that. And those fun things, the lively tiger and the baby Ellie and the butterfly, they match up pretty well with the vata, which is a little butterfly, always moving and, you know, light and feathery. And uh, Miss, Mr. Tiger, Miss Tiger, uh, she's like really angry and upset and, you know, smelly and yellow and red. <laughs> so, yeah, so those kind of things. Baby Ellie is very loving and nicely built and, you know, slow moving and soft and all of that. So, so it, this is a good mental depiction of what the qualities could be once you start looking at that. And you can start looking at your friends, you, after yourself, you know, once you look at yourself, you start looking at other friends, say, oh, that's the pitta coming out. That's the vata being imbalanced. And you stop being judgmental. You start just saying, okay, I know you are having an elemental balance and I'm okay with it. I forgive you, you know, or I'm okay and accept that. You know, so you, you started treating them because all of us are humans. We are all here on this planet Earth having a human experience. We're all in it together. If we are not connecting deeply with each other, we will be sort of living away from the cycles of nature and the intelligence and living in isolation. And that's not what nature has meant us to be. Nature wants really, wants us to, realize that our true interconnectedness and that's what ayurveda and yoga and all the philosophies from the eastern tradition and the ancient wisdom have talked about to really connect with each other and know that we all are similar and made of the same stuff and we go back to the same stuff so anyway 
and get carried away. So coming back to the body's uh, style, um, you know, Pitta is thin build, airy, fast, talks fast, thinks fast, you know, too, very lot of creativity, but can stay focused, you know, very distracted, starts five things at a time and cannot finish any, you know, in time. So that's Vata. Uh, creaky joints, achiness, all of those comes with Vata. Pretty slim and too thin sometimes. Um, Pitta uh, is well built typically and takes pride in the build and you know shows off and works out and all of that good stuff it with the if it's imbalanced and very sharp you know so smart type a personality so a little aggressive little like you know it's nothing wrong to be ambitious for sure very passionate uh, both in personal life work life everywhere they have a lot of passion and pursue their passion really well but sometimes if it's pushed too much that's when it gets imbalanced um, and starts uh, you know affecting the body like reflux and acidity and skin breakout because these are the organs and seats of pitta the eyes can go weak all of those are connected to pitta the fire principle the vata principle if it's imbalanced you'll get anxiety you'll get nervous type of depression your sleep will be disrupted you can't sleep your mind is active all of those things will happen for the kapha you know if it's they're stoutly built and excuse me for this slide um, because i couldn't find the right slide when kapha is just walking gently and slowly so balanced kapha is actually really good so they are very loving and compassionate because that's the essential nature of kapha. But they tend to love their food a little bit and not exercise as much. And that's the basic constitution they're born with. Doesn't mean that you cannot change some of the outside activity, which is the epigenetic, but definitely I have to explain that whatever you're born with, whether your prakriti, the basic constitution is vata or a pitta or a kapha or a certain mix of each, that stays stable throughout your life. The only thing changes is the slight imbalance. And that's what we use the nutrition, lifestyle practices and sleep, all of those to bring it back to balance. But the baseline is your basic constitution stays. And if a pitta, if a pitta person wants to, you know, become a vata type, <laughs> it's not possible and they will not feel grounded and not staying in the self because it's not natural for them. Similarly, if the kapha wants to become like underweight, they will not feel good. Their immunity will go down, they'll fall sick. All of those things will happen. Similarly, if a vata, you know, wants to become like, you know, kapha, that's difficult too. And we're talking more about the physical aspects. The mental aspects we'll talk very briefly. And I know we have very limited time, but hey, whatever. <laughs> this, as I said, this is endless wisdom. And I'm just, you know, showing you a little drop of that wisdom today. So anyway, the next slide we'll talk about the Ayurvedic treatment. And this is this slide is from a research article which I wrote. Um, in 2006 or 2007 regarding utilizing Ayurvedic tools to help with inflammation and cancer. So that was amazing. I was just, I had just come back from India, started practicing, was seeing amazing results. So we, we wrote a review article um, about that, working with MD Anderson Heart Cancer Hospital. And that was very well accepted, very highly cited couple of articles at that time. So anyway, um, so we utilize different modalities. We already are very familiar with yoga, meditation, mindfulness, massage. We, we talked about that briefly. The baseline is as many tools on the external and internal we can utilize, that's what we do. And it addresses all aspects of life, physical, psychological, spiritual, social, environmental, everything, you know, which makes us and makes communities around us. It's very individualized and personalized and treating the root cause as well as symptoms. And it also major focus is prevention. And that's where the topic of today is all about. So we'll talk about that. And I want spend so much time in 
you know, details of the self-care practices. These are all listed here. You can go back and take a look. These are self-explanatory, but Ayurveda does mention and highly recommends a whole foods plant-based diet, including as much organic, local, you know, seasonal. So there's a lot of things about the daily cycle and the seasonal cycle and the cycle of the ages with Ayurveda. There's so much of extensive wisdom pearls hiding in that beautiful um, system. So we'll talk briefly in the next few slides about plant-based foods. You guys are all familiar with what to do and what to eat and you know what's with spices and herbs and all of those. There are certain things like cooking practices and eating habit practices which Another colleague, uh, Dr. Shah, had reviewed some of the mindful eating in the and cooking in the kitchen. So that was really great talk. And then um, Dr. Aruna Nathan talked about some of the herbs and spices used in kitchen. So that was really good too. And several other um, lifestyle medicine doctors covered a lot of these uh, topics already. So living in tune with nature and the seasons, treating all beings equally with love and respect without judgment and providing service. So pro considering yourself as a tool for service to humanity, mankind, and to the planet and universe, and, and. So because we are all connected. So that's the whole concept. Very briefly, colorful depiction of what we already talked about, prevention, you know, reversal, not reversal of disease, but reversal of the imbalance and restoration of health, spiritual health, all of that. Briefly, daily routine, seasonal routine, diet, exercise, sleep, all of the, those are synced with the daily intelligent cycle of nature. And we'll, we'll go on to the next slide now um, and talk briefly about how Ayurveda overlaps with the modern evidence-based, uh, you know, of research, um, amazing amount of research which we have found recently. So Ayurveda has been mentioning all of these denature, which is the daily routine, for thousands of years, and people kept well and you know continued practice then in homes and continued having healthy lifestyles um, and enjoyed good health as a result. But because of the modern lifestyle disruptors of industrial age and you know, technological age, all of those, we've, we've all fell out of sync of living like that. So this is that slide again, um, just a brief reminder, and I'll show you in the next slide how Ayurveda overlaps really well, including the vata, pitta, and kapha times of the day. So early morning, the vata time starts between two to six. Six to 10 is the kapha time. So every cycle is a four hour cycle and it's a 24 hour cycle. And it's overlapped beautifully between this slide and this slide. So it's exactly the same. And it shows how the vata, pitta, kapha moves in the body and in the system. And if we follow that cycle, we'll revert back to health. So this is another little listing of things which Ayurveda recommends. For example, waking up before sunrise, if possible. And that syncs your melatonin production amazingly well uh, with the sunlight. You know, you wake up before the sunlight, so your melatonin starts decreasing when the dawn is there and when the sun the blue light comes hey there you go melatonin goes down and all the other hormones related to it settle in the leptin ghrelin you know the insulin cortisol all of those come to their normal cyclical uh, rhythm and it takes few weeks or months to reset that cycle if you're working in a night shift so don't be impatient just be compassionate and have patience with yourself so um, yeah, and you can go come back and look at this uh, slide and just letting you know that all of those imbalances, including sleep, metabolic imbalance, microbiotic, like, you know, all the microbiome that gets disrupted if you are disturbed because it 
changes the way bacteria are behaving and producing their little um, good things and cardiovascular aging, all of those can be helped. It decreases disease burden and focuses on prevention of disease. That's what it does basically. So next couple of slides are coming up with a lot of colorful material in there. So Ayurveda talks about the time of consuming food and very briefly, very simply put, and there's some nuances to it. So Ayurveda has very beautiful listings of recommended ways and style of eating, starting from connecting with where the food is coming from basically. So connecting with, and preferably local, uh, connecting with the local farmers, organic, making sure that you're, you know, keeping in touch with that. And also, um, you know, being loving and kind and mindful when you're preparing the food, that's very important. Uh, putting all your love, a lot of people chant or say prayers, even before they start cooking, being thankful to the farmers, all of those and then serving it in a nice setting with good ambience, you know, maybe some aromatherapy on a dinner table rather than running on the car and, you know, grabbing a bite. <laughs> that's, that's not what the recommendation is. So eating mindfully, peacefully, maybe practicing saying a prayer before eating, that really helps too, because that lowers the vagal tone and that really helps. So timing of consuming food, lighter breakfast, heavier lunch and light and early dinner is recommended as per your hunger. So please play, you know, focus on as per your hunger. So don't try to force yourself to eat when you're not hungry and try not to starve unnecessarily. Intermittent fasting with timed eating is okay if you want to shift back to balance, but extensive, you know, the extreme fasting is not recommended because it does cause some imbalance. And we'll talk more about that. It's very personalized and individualized. So if somebody really needs to fast, like medical supervised fasting, that's fine. But on your own, you, you try not to do extremes of those unsupervised. So it's always good to do all of these therapies and changes under guided supervision. Quantity of food is very important. So it's the old saying, you know, not just in Indian, but Japanese and Chinese traditions that only eat to 80% of your stomach volume and leave the 20% for mixing the food with the water and the juices and the, the air. So it can really aerate and digest well sequence of consuming food. So a lot of people will continue to drink a lot of amount of water along with eating. And that's really not recommended unless it's a dry food. So if you're already eating soups and stews, there's no need for you to drink high amount of water because that will digest the, or that will liquid or dilute the digestive enzymes. And uh, similarly, you can drink water like half an hour before or one hour later, that's not a problem. There's certain other rules and method of consuming food. So freshly cooked, non, you know, non, uh, yeah, fresh, organic, local, all of those uh, cooked well with the right kind of spices and herbs according to your body type and the seasons is very important. And trying to eat along with like close friends or loved ones, Try not to talk when you're eating, you know, focus on all the six tastes. And Ayurveda has a unique concept about six tastes. Most people will think about like sweet, sour, salty, and maybe bitter, but there are a couple of other tastes uh, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So pungent and astringent. And I don't know whether uh, you can name what foods have which kind of taste predominantly, um, and feel free to write it in the chat, but here's some of the answers and the combination of the elements which are in them. And you know, what effects can it have on the body is like a big, another lecture. So anyway, another talk. So, so we'll talk about now shifting towards the mental aspect of health and healing, because that's very important. Most of the diseases start in the mind with the thought process. 
And if we can bring our thoughts to a better, stable and happy place, we, those would not cause, you know, downwards stream as a disease. So anyway, the three gunas. So gunas are the qualities um, which are ingrained in certain properties. Um, so for example, uh, you know, sattva is light, clear, stable. All of those, you know, happy, peaceful, clarity, creativity, all of those are sattvic, balance, you know, all of those good qualities. And we tend to, we should all strive to become more sattvic because those are the ideal or uh, desirable qualities. Rajsik is cloudy, agitated, too much movement. It's energizing, but it's very turbulent. You know, it's a lot of passion, desire, you know, anxiety, ego, you know, a lot of ego. All of those are rajasic qualities of the mind. And tamasic qualities, the th tamas nature is dark, heavy, inertia, inactivity, negativity, pessimism, you know, dullness, darkness, all of those. It really closes the mind makes you really um, feel low and closed and separated. And ignorance, all of those are qualities of tamas. So these are three words I wanted to introduce. And we'll talk about food, you know, which can actually, which have those qualities and which can lead you to being more sattvic, which is the pure, peaceful, happy, clear, light, calming, harmonized, at ease, um, feeling, and properties. So let's talk about that in the next one. So sattvic guna and diet, and you can read it here. Fresh fruit foods, including fresh fruits and vegetables, as long as they're not very heavy or, you know, uh, difficult to digest, and a lot of grains, oats, whole moong dal. So traditionally, ghee used to be considered sattvic, and it's still considered sattvic um, in the traditional ways when, they're, when it's still produced in the traditional style, which is loving, calmness, uh, calming, and very supportive way, and not the commercial factory farmed, you know, pushed with antibiotic hormones, toxins, and force impregnated, not that one. So that is more a, like himsic ghee and the traditional sattvic ghee was more ahimsa, more sustainable. The cows were raised in as your own family members. They were worshiped. They were fed the best of nutrients. Their calves were led to drink the milk completely and whatever was left over, if the calf didn't leave for the day, you're done. You don't get in, any milk from them. So you you, you were the second in, waiting in turn to receive that milk. So the extra milk was the gift from the mother cow uh, whenever they delivered the babies. And you know if they produced a lot because we were feeding them really well, they will share that gift with us. Because some of the properties of the ghee were found to be amazing and healing. Um, but again, unfortunately in today's day and world, it's everything is messed up in, in the production of dairy and poultry any animal um, uh, food, everything is like gone downhill because of the food industry. They made it really business and materialism, all of that. So anyway, uh, going on to the next slide is Rajasik. And these foods can make the mind a little bit more uh, restless or agitated. So people who are on the spiritual path, uh, who want to progress in the spiritual path, they are recommended to go a little less on this. Uh, you know, it's limited. Again, it's moderation. If you have to work really hard, you have to be physically a lot of, you know, active in your work, please go ahead and eat some of the tomatoes and enjoy the radishes and corn and chilies and, and hot spices. Some of the sattvic spices are like ginger, turmeric, saffron, cardamom, cumin. 
all of those are sattvic spices. And these are not comprehensive lists. These are just examples which I've written down. Some of the very pungent and strong, like chili pepper spices is a rasic. It'll shake you up. And similarly, garlic and onions, they will like, okay, I feel the bite and, and that's the pungentness of it. So going on to the next one, tamasic. Um, so toxic foods are stale and dead and really heavy to digest. And obviously, you know, all meat, most of the meat and animal products are considered toxic. If a um, lot of the heavy foods, especially if they're grown with pesticides and, you know, sprays and all, they are also considered toxic, deep fried and, you know, too much of over fermented food, not the lighter fermented foods, um, but over fermented foods um, and aged foods, un unfortunately, leftovers, too much. <laughs> so too much leftovers, like if you keep your food made in the fridge for like five days, there's not much prana or vital energy left in them. So the recommendation is, I know it must be, it might be disturbing to hear, but that is the basic fact of the how the elements behave. So, and you cannot take away from the truth of that because we all are functioning under that, you know, the intelligence of nature. So that's the truth. And obviously it's convenient. Should you give yourself grief if you are not able to cook daily or every other day or whatever? No, whatever works best for you. So in case you're not able to eat healthy food, obviously eating outside takes away from a lot of healthy eating. So if the option is only for you to cook your meals and keep it in the fridge for several days, that's fine. So give yourself permission. Again, remember Ayurveda is all about, it's very adaptable. It, you have to do whatever is best for you in the moment and strive to get better if you can. So that's the teaching of those ancient uh, wisdom. They were very wise systems and they were very realizing of the humanness and the limitations and barriers in all of us. And that's why it was, this whole wisdom was there to support humans to walk on the path of realizing their true being rather than creating dilemmas and decision-making issues and guilt. That was not the intent. So the intent was do whatever you can, knowing the, the true facts and whatever you can manage without creating so much of disturbance in the mind, because you don't want to have the mind disturbed so it'll reflect and you know stick down in the body you don't want that so so again being grateful thankful to yourself compassionate towards yourself non-judgmental towards yourself and others all of those are essential to have a healthy you know lifestyle so personalized Ayurvedic recommendations, we'll talk very brief. I'll just skip over some of the slides because I know we're running behind, like royally. Um, eight limbs of yoga, Ashtanga yoga, Ashta is eight and limbs. So Yama, Nema, Asana, Pranayama, all of those are limbs and parts of yoga. And yoga is union. And what is the union with? The union is with the self, the little self with the big self. That's the whole idea. So, um, and read up more um, if you're curious. So I'm so thankful to be involved and trained. And, you know, I, I had a long journey of learning through ages. And I worked with Blue Zones. We have a lovely uh, neighborhood city, which is Blue Zone certified. So I got involved in that. And they have these nine qualities or principles which they live by. Blue zones are areas of the world which have the centenarians, like 100 years old people, like the longest living people. And, you know, Icaria, Loma Linda, all of those areas are blue zones. And moving naturally, belonging to the society, having a purpose in life, those are very important important principles in those societies. And, you know, 80 person rules comes out of that, plants land, all of those good things come from the blue zones. 
uh, whole health is a really um, amazing approach to healthcare, which the VA is taking right now for the last several years. And it's implementing that and it's shifting the mindset from the illness or disease-based model to the wellness-based model. So it's, and it's looking at the person as a whole, with me in the center, surrounded by mindful awareness, surrounded by these little circles of health, again, nutrition, sleep, surroundings, personal development, you know, recharging family, friends, coworkers, spirit and the soul, power of the mind, surrounded by professional care. So we as clinicians, you know, doctors, physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, all the staff are providing the care, including complementary and integrated health. And I am so thankful to be part of this beautiful healing approach, which the VA has adopted. And I'm really um, honored to be part of, you know, the, the big implementation workforce and leading it. So very, very thankful. And obviously the complementary and integrative health, including the six, uh, the eight uh, main approved modalities, acupuncture, yoga, movement therapies, like Tai Chi and Qigong, and then massage therapy, biofeedback, clinical hypnosis, all these are evidence-based. And that's why the VA, and evidence strong. And that's why the VA has adopted them. These are not the woo-woo things, uh, you know, which we used to think like 50 years back, what is acupuncture? And we found out that it works. And then yoga works. And mindfulness is the big answer for the stress pandemic, which we are facing right now. So anyway, long story short, so community, which contains me, in different zones, so it's all V together. So that's the whole health concept. And I'm so, so grateful that we're offering it to the veterans and that's an amazing service to give it a little service to offer to the ones who have served the country. Similarly, lifestyle medicine. I was really amazed to find such a beautiful group of people talking about the same six pillars of health, you know, the eating, physical activity, we, we talked about that. So wonderful, such a beautiful dynamic of organization and it's taking it forward and really spreading the awareness. And I'm so thankful to be part of it. Anyway, so personalized recommendations. A um, lot of, um, you know, it's very, very unique. Again, people, I have to look at the person as a whole, including the surrounding mental, physical, emotional, spiritual makeup, and then make my recommendation. So that's how I approach healing. You connect with them, you find out what's really important to them, what they want in their life, what really matters, what's doable, what's not doable, what are the barriers, what are the support system, what are their strengths, all of them and be tied all together when we are healing them. So anyway, um, very fast run through of evidence and research on massage. The right hand side is very strong evidence, low back pain, neck, labor, multi, you know, multiple joint pains, fibromyalgia, all of that. Mindfulness in the next one is amazing for depression, mental illness, chronic diseases, pain, anxiety. All of those are document evidence-based things which are coming from the ancient wisdom techniques. Yoga, we talked about that. Amazing uh, list for low back pain and depression, but also for hypertension, headache, GI issues, anxiety, obesity, asthma, you know, insomnia. I mean, cancers, it really helps with how people feel during and after cancer. So there's amazing research available. All right, shifting gears a little bit. Very briefly, this is just a list of active ingredients of herbs and spices, which have found to be medicinally beneficial. And, uh, you know, and all of these are listed here. You can go back and research and read more about it. I had a couple of papers based on this. There's enough evidence on how these help and how you can add them to your diet. So a couple more things. Uh, this is a scripture for, and there's hundreds of scriptures like this about what the herbs are recommended for and how they would help. 
and what conditions to use them in and what combinations to use them with, which, which body type of people ideally should eat it, which should not. So all of those was written down like sort of, you know, very in detail in this. For example, shunti, which is uh, ginger, says in the, in the highlighted portion, shul prashamana, that means it suppresses pain and aches. And then vata gani, that means it pacifies vata, the imbalance of wind in the body. And on the other side is haridra, which is turmeric. And meheshu, that means it takes away obesity and you know diseases related like diabetes and all, it helps with that. Vishgana, that means it kills the poison basically. So it's antioxidant and anti toxic. So all of those are um, really, really helpful to know and find out what really works and what would not work. Coming back to one of my last favorite um, things. So there's a lot of amazing evidence in chanting and music. And so we all know about music is being utilized for like cancer patients and other therapies and anxiety and depression. They have done studies in plants and shown with Mozart playing, the plant will grow beautiful and better. And if it was like rock and <laughs> heavy metal, obviously it wouldn't be that happy and it'll be retarded and stunted. So if plants can behave like that, think of us with very highly evolved nervous system. And I forgot to mention the melatonin it actually cyclically, cyclically produced in plants also. And the list of herbs and foods, which I showed you, they ideally produce the melatonin at the peak of the day. And that's the ideal time the biggest meal should be eaten for us. Anyway, coming back to chanting. Um, so everything, so obviously we know by quantum physics that everything is in a state of vibration. And when we are healthy, it's a natural, resonant vibration, very gentle. And once it gets out of sync, like frequency, counter frequency, the energy becomes stuck, non flowing, and then disease comes in. So basically, think of it like, you know, the, the, the talk about the clock, and it's working really well with the rhythm. And the top clock, the central clock, master clock is saying, yes, go to sleep. And then you're feeding or you're putting light and it's desyncing it. So that's causing disease basically. So just remember that at the back of your mind when you approach different things and be a little bit more mindful going forward. So excellent studies have shown the neurohemodynamic correlates of own chanting, which is very well known. It causes the limbic activity reduction. A limbic system is related with stress and anxiety and, you know, it, it's also positively related with emotion and learning, but in a positive way, but it's disturbed. It actually decreases learning, decreases motivation, makes you really negatively emotional. So, so all of that is reset by chanting. Similarly, vagus nerve stimulation is really helped um, by chanting. It's tones of the vagus nerve and makes you in the parasympathetic mode rather than sympathetic go, 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 fight and flight mode turns that off. And also it influences in cells and animal studies it's shown decreasing the growth of cancer cells for blood pressure, hypertension, COPD, asthma, there's several other benefits. So I will like to, after I show you my little uh, golden milk recipe, I'll, I like to finish with uh, chanting after we do some questions. And all. Well, I'll do the chanting first and then we'll do questions. All right, this is a little joke, just to, you know, have fun that you're eating more fresh food and vegetables. Be, cheer be careful to chew, otherwise you'll start sprouting. So yeah, don't let it sit in your tummy too long, otherwise you'll sprout. So have good bowel movements, that's very important. All right, and don't crazily fixate about the food. So, all right. So golden milk, very easy to make at home. This is a slide. I'll be happy to have this posted in the notes so you can look back at it 
you know, in the chat notes. Um, very simple, mixing these ingredients. A lot of the time what I do, I pre-mix the powder and keep it separate. Like I'll take the turmeric in a jar, I'll add some crushed black pepper, which actually increases the bioavailability of curcumin, which is the active ingredient of turmeric. And then I'll add some little ginger, little cinnamon, and keep it ready for mixing in my golden heated milk. Um, and I make my own almond milk and cashew milk and coconut milk at home. And there are enough tons of recipes you can always buy. Uh, from the market. When I make it at home, it lasts me around three to four days. So I make it twice a week. So heat everything up, all the ingredients. Um, you know, you can use fresh grated ginger if you want. I can handle powder ginger, it's a little stronger. Uh, grated ginger is a little milder compared to the powder. So do whatever works best for you. And then uh, peppercorns, you can either, as I said, fresh grind them or keep them in a little jar. A lot of people actually mix it in water and keep it in the fridge because it's much easier and faster to dissolve. But that's, again, individual choice. So cardamom is amazing. It really is a great digestive, carminative. It's another sattvic herb, just like cinnamon and turmeric and ginger and saffron are. So this is a pure sattvic drink. That means it will cause lightness, happiness, you know, all those positive blissfulness emotions to come up, more rested, more, more um, content feeling in your body and mind. And if you want the extra sweetener, you can, you know, add a little bit of date paste or any other natural sweetener. Um, you know, I, I just put the date in it and at the end of it, that's my treat. So, so do whatever. So anyway, I just want to close the PowerPoint with the chant and I would um, love to have you just close your eyes and sit in a comfortable position, whatever works best for you. Just, you know, just bring yourself to a more grounded space and settle down. I will start with um, chanting OM three times um, and just uh, feel that vibration. Uh, if you can, or if you know how to chant OM, which is A, U, and M mm combined. So A sound coming from your deep tummy, U coming from your chest and the upper body, and M mm coming from the neck up to the head. And then after that, we will close uh, this with another uh, hymn, which is really beautiful, and it's a healing uh, Shanti mantra, which is mantra of peace. So, so we'll chant Om, and then we'll shift off to Asatoma Sadgame. And you might have heard about this um, soundtrack. In fact, it's in um, the movie Matrix, and it's called Navarasa. I'll just play very briefly. So. Readers might get a hang of it, like just, you know, just know, but this is very different from what we chant, so. <laughs> Yeah, we got a hang of how they used it in Matrix Revolutions, Navara soundtrack. So anyway, coming back to the own chanting, finishing by Asatoma Sadgamaya. So just sit in your place and sit comfortably. I'll just start chanting. So, and you can follow me if you want, along with me, so whatever works for you. Uh... Ah. Ah.
and then we'll just briefly chant Asutoma Sadgamaya. And I'll chant um, so you can just listen. Asutoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityur Mamritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Wishing you everybody healing, truth, light, immortality, and peace. Thank you. Wow. All right, I'll stop sharing. Well, I'll take home tips. So <laughs> just a little take home tips for whatever um, you want to take responsibility, getting to know yourself better, better learning to do the healthy daily routines, waking it up in time, sleeping in time, eating in time, eating the right way and right food, not overstuffing, you know, not being judgmental, be compassionate, love, limiting exposure to the wrong things or not so conducive to your health things, um, you know, being human. So the, those are all being forgetful, um, forgiving of yourself and others, restoring balance, being good service, all of those. So take home whatever you would like. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Let me stop sharing. And then, oh my God, we really overdid the time here. That's okay. It was well worth it. You're, you have such a lovely voice. Everyone's saying that as well as me. And it's just so, you're so relaxing to listen to. Thank you. Yeah, I relax. Like all the vibrations settle down and, you know, the cells start vibrating in sync and harmony. So, do, do yeah. Do you actually teach yoga classes as well? I used to teach yoga classes earlier in my community practice, but in the VA, we are blessed with yoga trainers and practitioners um, who teach. I will be actually teaching a uh, you some like a guest yoga classes at the VA too. Wow, yeah. that is just it's amazing. People are asking, can you chant while walking if they wanted to yes. start chanting? Yes, as long as you know you you're moving the breath fine, there's no problem with chanting. In fact, you can chant internally every moment. So just like breath which is constant and thankfully it's constant, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So, <laughs> so just like the breath which goes on, the chanting can go on in the mind nonstop. So while you're cooking, while you're walking, while you're scrubbing the dishes, while you're dancing, well, dancing might be a little challenge, but uh, <laughs> definitely during walking, yes, you can. Okay. People were asking what you meant by get up before the sun. Like, so how early do we have to get up? So I, yeah, that's an amazing question. And thank you for asking that. That means you're really curious and wanting to learn more. So in Ayurveda, it's recommended to wake up in the Brahma Mahurita, which is the auspicious hour around one and a half hours before sunrise. But in the modern day, any time before sunrise is ideal. So a lot of the, you know, professionally and successful and spiritually advanced uh, practitioners, they actually wake up in the Brahma Mahurta because the whole elemental energy at the time is very calm, stable, very conducive for meditation, focusing, and also for spiritual practices. Great, that's so good. JL was saying, we should end every broadcast with this. I don't know if you can come back every day though and, and do this for us. <laughs> Oh my God, who, who said that? JL said, but- Oh, okay, okay. We can, have, and every, can we end every video like this? Well, we can, but I don't think every doctor has as lovely as a voice. 
Oh my God, I'll be happy to come back and do a session on like the evidence of chanting or whatever works for anybody. What do most patients come to see you for in your practice? Because you have so many hats that you're wearing. Are they coming just for regular lifestyle diseases or because you're the local doctor? So who, who comes to see you? So in my community practice, it was word of mouth, basically, uh, you know, people who were really wanting to get healthy and looking for natural ways of healing themselves. And people with chronic diseases like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, you know, all of, you know, hormonal issues and gut, you know, GI immunity issues, all of those were coming hypertension, diabetes, obesity. I used to do workshops and classes for them, um, you know, use, utilizing plant-based diet and other tools, but very complex patients and very proactive patients. So the whole range used to come. I had consultation, even though I'm an internist, that means I can treat patients. I'm trained to treat patients from 18 years old to elderly. Um, I used to consult with, you know, with babies and toddlers because their parents really, really wanted that personalized approach and they couldn't find any traditional trained healers like that. So, but in the VA, I see the traditional, you know, the veteran population, which has a burden of, you know, PTSD because of the extreme trauma, anxiety, depression, a lot of psychological issues, a lot of physical, mental, emotional issues, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, arthritis, rheumatoid, gout, you know, all of those. Yeah. Well, where do you start with them? Because I, as wonderful as like say, chanting is, if somebody, you know, has type two diabetes and if that it's probably not enough. So where, how do you work with them holistically? Do you change their diet first? Do you get them to meditate first? What, where do you start? So I, I utilize a couple of tools together. It's a step up approach. I'll see where the patient is coming from, what they're willing and ready and capable of doing or interested in doing. So I totally sync it what, what their needs and wants are. And obviously I use my intuitive judgment and sort of approach it that way. But I do ask them, I utilize motivational interviewing techniques and really engage with them and, you know, and see where they're coming up, what their interests, like a lot of patients who are Christians, they would not want, you know, some of them resist chanting. I would offer them chanting peace or amen or whatever works for them. You know, there's different things which we can do. Some people like yoga, some people like Tai Chi, some people like, you know, just physical exercises, regular activity. So those kind of things. And definitely nutrition is one of the keys, which I start with, along with practices, which I teach them the deep breathing and relaxation techniques, because unless we take care of the mind, just by trying to correct the body, it doesn't work and it's not sustainable. So we have to work on the mind too. But sometimes what they're interested in doing, they don't always seem capable of doing. Like, like take weight loss, for example. Most people are interested in losing weight, but they're not necessarily interested in changing their diet or exercise pattern. Totally. So we work together with the barriers they're facing and finding out what is holding them back, if they feel confident or not in doing things, and how confident they feel, how motivated they are, what support system they have. So engaging all of those and working around the barriers. Like for example, if they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, can they get it like, you know, either in packaged or whatever way, or, you know, those kind of like little, little tweaks to their barriers and work around. Great. Uh, Christissa says, does it matter what time of day melatonin rich foods are consumed? So typically not, uh, you know, you can consume them anytime. The plants even, so that's a great question. And I'm glad you, Krista, you asked it. Um, there has been research studies actually, which have shown that even after plucking and, you know, the, the fruits and the vegetables, the plants will still continue sinking with the cycle of nature. So they will still basically increase their um, melatonin to max during midday. And then obviously go down as the days goes 
down and then you know it's low in the morning and then peaks up except if you're buying it from the produce section where there's 24 hours light and then they're totally messed up and confused and they've lost that connection with the the intelligence of nature Great. so then there's yeah so ideally um melatonin food rich foods can be eaten all during the day it's it's the precursors and what you know it basically is long acting in the system that it it acts, yeah. Other than your golden milk, do you have any other favorite recipes you like to have regularly? Oh yeah, totally. So my favorite recipes are moong dal, which is the green moong. And sometimes I make kitri, which is a combination of moong and rice. And I put a lot of colorful vegetables along with this, like according to the season and what my body needs are at that time. Nice. Elizabeth says she wonders if you can tell us what your dosha type is. And I'm curious, do you know mine just by looking at me? Because I tried to do the quiz, but they all wanted my email. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I can I can definitely um, guess yours uh, is a vata predominant. Um, and uh, mine is pretty close, actually. Pitta, vata, and kapha, you know, so I'm like a 36% pitta and a little bit of vata and then a little bit of kapha, which is pretty unusual and rare. It's not unusual, but it's rare to, to get all those three in a sort of balanced proportion. Most people are a mix of two and some people are one predominant. So most people are vata, pitta or pitta, kapha or kapha vata combination. Yeah, mine is, I, I would call, I'm tridosha. Um, tridosha means all three doshas, but uh, sometimes my, you know, because of modern living, sometimes my vata get, um, gets out of balance. Um, my pitta sometimes rarely will, you know, flare up a little bit, but typically I'm pretty, I pretty, I, because I proactively, I've been doing it for so many years, it stays in balance most of the time. It takes a lot of work and awareness. So in the beginning to set up habits, it takes more work. Once you've got the habit after practicing it for a few weeks, then it's easy. Is a dosha something you're born with or could it change? Because you know, I used to be obese. I used to be about 80 pounds more than I weigh now. Did I still have the same dosha or was like I a kapha in vata clothing? So, <laughs> so <laughs> very excellent question. So there is a body constitution which you're born with and that's called body prakriti. And yours is actually a vata and a kapha combination, but you do have more vata imbalance right now. Um, and which is fine. I mean, you know, as long as you are managing well in your life and maybe learning more things to bring that vata to better balance. Um, that will be great. So prakriti stays same. It's your genetic imprint. That's what you're born with. That's what your elements will dissolve when you pass. So, so that stays. It's the vikriti, which is the imbalance, which plays on top of the prakriti and shifts every moment or day or with seasons and with the the ages, as we age, they shift too. So that's called Vikriti and that's changeable. And you can bring it back to balance. Where do I go to get my Vata balance? Because that's that's uh, <laughs> something- Come to me. <laughs> but you're yeah, in Washington. Do you, do you work with people virtually? Yes, I'll be starting to offer one-to-one -one consultation starting August, because right now we are moving and there's so many things going on. <laughs> So one-to-one so -one and also workshops I'll be offering, including your Ayurvedic body type and how to bring it in balance and the daily dinacharya. This is the daily routine. So I'm looking at those too. So how do people connect with you? Do you spend most of your time on a particular social media or is there a way to sign up uh, at your, on your mailing list? Totally. So either ways is fine. I typically, I started... I'm not much of a social media person, except I'm on Facebook because I connect with international family and friends. So definitely that's one of the better ways. Probably the best way would be through website. So your email is there and I can respond to you. If you have a question, I can address that. Facebook, I do frequent uh, often. So that's another one. And I'm on Instagram. I don't do much on Twitter. I'll just go and check after every two months or so or whatever. <laughs> 
Wow, people are saying you have beautiful hair. Oh, thank you. Oh, a story about my hair. Oh my God. So, so I, I am genetically, uh, hereditarily blessed with good hair. I grew my hair, my largest, longest hair was up to my ankles during medical college. And then, you know, obviously when I came here, I've, I've donated it several times to cancer survivor. Yeah. So, oh, and it grew. That's, grows. that's yeah. so nice. So the, like locks of love sort of. Oh yeah, totally. Locks of love. And the longest one, which I donated was uh, around two and a half feet long, the, the length. Wow, that is incredible. Thank you so much. You know, one thing I forgot to ask you, and usually I start with this, is when did you first adopt a plant-based diet? So I grew up being a vegetarian. We used to eat, you know, the paneer and ghee and milk. Um, yeah, I remember in childhood, I never used to like milk, but my mom used to force that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> so anyway, when I came to the U.S., um, we didn't realize how harmonically pushed and how toxic the dairy was here. Um, you know, I started noticing declining health and impacts on my body. And by the time I trained um, in all these alternative medicine systems, that's when I decided to shift. So it was around, and I would say probably to early 2000. 12 or 2011 somewhere around that that I went vegan and before that I was plant-based I had tried eating fish temporarily and that was another experience um you know that's another long story <laughs> so right, well, we'll have you maybe another day and then once your practice is in place maybe you can actually do a little bit of a cooking demo oh totally I would love to I wish my kitchen was you know demonstrable right now everything is packed and yeah. Great. Well, I wish you well in your new in your move and in your new endeavor. And thank you so much for sharing your passion and expertise with our audience. Thank you. I'm so grateful to you and all to all the audience who are here on a Sunday afternoon and listening and interacting. And I'm appreciative of your inquiry, open mindedness, and questions. Yeah. Do you have any CDs? Because you have a lovely voice, and I was thinking like a, like for going to sleep at night, just hearing you chant or speak. Oh my God, that's so cute. A lot of my patients have requested that in the past too. And I'm, I think I'm just going to do it soon. Well, you, yeah, that would be amazing. Well, thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you, Chef AJ. Bye-bye. Oh, my pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Terrence Tay. He survived a nearly fatal heart attack and went on to lose 75 pounds. And he's going to be telling his story, which is called From Shamu to Sardine. Thank you again. Be well.